Oh, um, I'm not going to be like this for long. Considering that this is a more uh, sensational occasion, I'm going to do something a little different to present the show. The only catch is that I got to be less, well, flashy to pull it off correctly. So um, if you could excuse me for a sec. Okay, time for my big debut. All right, let's go and uh, get ourselves comfortable here. You comfortable? Yeah, I'm comfortable. All right, good. So I think with all that said, we are all ready. What? Okay, okay, I know. Technically, the puppeteer is supposed to be hidden from the camera so that he doesn't break the illusion. But what makes the magic of puppetry work is that as long as the puppet itself is interesting enough, then who the fridge cares about the guy behind me? He'll eventually just be part of the background. Weird, I know, but that is something I've learned from one of my biggest inspirations and possibly the most beloved puppeteer of all time, Jim Henson. And that is why I will tell not the story of the man himself, let's be honest, that's already been told enough, but rather the story of the colorful characters that are carrying his legendary legacy, the Muppets. Now for this look back, we'll be following Kermit and the gang's journey from being nonsensical TV stars to entertainment icons who dominated television, movies, and even in a few unexpected places. It's a story with plenty of admirable highs and even some tough times, but no matter what happens, both the Muppets and the performers underneath them always go through it in the craziest way that they know how to do best. And now that it's time that we play the music and it's time that we light the lights, it's time to get things started on the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational, Muppetational look back this show has ever seen. This is what we call Animation Look Back The Muppets. I didn't expect that we'd be that accurate to the show. Anyways, let's begin our story in Washington, D.C. During the mid-1950s, at the local television station WRC-TV, television director James Kovac hired a rambunctious college freshman with a knack for puppets named James Maury Henson. But you may know him more as Jim. Born in Greenville, Mississippi on September 24, 1936, Jim was always fascinated by the new invention at the time that revolutionized entertainment, television. In fact, he was so amazed with the new medium ever since his parents got the family one as a teenager, he decided to pursue a career in television, influenced by the entertainers he grew up with when he watched Milton Berle or listened to Edgar Bergen on the radio. His opportunity came in 1954 when the TV station, WTOP-TV, was looking for a puppeteer for the series The Junior Morning Show, and he immediately learned about the basics of both puppeteering and making puppets. His time with the station was rather short, mainly due to the show getting cancelled after three weeks for breaking child labor laws, and even after having Jim's puppet segments move to another WTOP series, Saturday, he left to attend the University of Maryland. But considering how his puppet work was well received both by critics and the people at the station, it did not go unnoticed. Which leads back to our starting point where Jim was picked up by WRC. Kovac and the station loved what Henson did at WTOP and wanted to use his sketches of his puppets lip syncing to records on their variety show, Afternoon. During that time, his newborn pursuit in puppeteering already grew, as he gained a collaborator for his projects with a fellow university student named Jane Nebel, and found a name for his unique brand of puppets called the Muppets. It was said that the term was a combination of the words marionette and puppet, but Henson later admitted that it was just something that he made up. And like before, 
the Muppet segments of Afternoon turned out to be a great hit, and WRC wanted to expand them into their own show. Something to fill that five-minute slot that's in the middle of the evening news and The Tonight Show. It put a bit of pressure on Jim and Jane, but they came up with an idea for what would become the first ever Muppet show. Sam and Friends is brought to you by... Ask her. On the evening of May 9th, 1955, WRC released the first episode of Sam and Friends, a variety show where the title character, Sam, escapes reality by hanging out with his abstract imaginary friends, where they started with Henson's usual shtick of his characters lip-syncing to records. In the series, many of the Muppets featured were already made for the previous shows Jim worked on, including the first puppet he ever built, Pierre the French Rat. During the first episodes, the puppets that were featured include Sam, who was only used for lip-syncing songs, Yorick, a gluttonous purple head that was the fan favorite, Harry the Hipster, the cool beatnik, Professor Madcliffe, the energetic professor who talks about the show's sponsor, which was mostly SK Meats and then Wilkins Coffee by the end of its run, and Chicken Liver, a sophisticated Muppet who looks down upon the others for their lack of culture. Including Pierre, the other Muppets that later joined the show were Hank and Frank, Henrietta, Icky Gunk, Moldy Hay, Mushmelon, and Omar. And then there was one Muppet that stood out from the rest. He had always been a part of the original cast, and while he may have been only the fourth most popular Muppet in Sam and Friends, he gradually became Jim's favorite and the one that ended up appearing the most in the program. Made out of his mother's turquoise spring coat and a ping pong ball cut in two halves for the eyes, he was a lizard-like Muppet that later gained a voice that was a soft-spoken version of Jim's. His name was Kermit. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm taking a course in visual thinking. It teaches you how to visualize your thoughts. Watch. Q. See that? Man, you're just a beginner. I'm an old hand at this stuff. Watch. Hey, a real watch. With moving parts, no less. There were rumors that his name was based on his childhood friend, Kermit Scott, but that was later debunked. What could most likely be the case, though, is that Jim got the name from the show's sound engineer, Kermit Kalman Cohen. As it was released during the infancy of television, Sam and Friends was an innovation in the field of puppetry. One of the reasons being how Jim and Jane built the Muppets. Back then, Puppets were commonly known to be made out of wood, and their movements were notably rigid and often limited. However, with Jim's Muppets, with a few exceptions like Sam and Yorick being made out of paper mache, they are made out of foam rubber covered in fabric, allowing the characters to be a lot more flexible so that they could express a wide range of emotions. And instead of using marionette strings, Henson placed rods on the Muppet's arms to give the puppeteers extra control over his characters or sleeves so that their hands can become the Muppets. Another innovation from the show is the stage itself. Before, puppets were usually confined by the limits of the stage that they generally perform in, even when it was for television. In Sam and Friends, there was no limit to the Muppet stage. It took advantage of the new medium of television and had the freedom of moving the camera around with the Muppets. When the series aired in 1955, it was a major hit in the Washington DC area. In fact, it was so much of a hit that when the station canceled it after its first episode or moved it away from its usual evening time, they received significant backlash and had no choice but to put it back on again. This allowed Sam and Friends to expand with more elaborate skits that exercised Jim's writing skills and over-the-top comedy, had him give the Muppets new voices, and even later be filmed in color. But their growth wouldn't just stop within the show itself. On October 11th the following year, Jim and Jane were invited to audition for The Tonight Show with Steve Allen when the showrunners heard about this crazy program that was showing just before them in D.C and they managed to get them on the air with a performance featuring Kermit lip-syncing with a wig and Yorick trying to eat his foot, thus introducing the Muppets to the entire nation. 
Of course, this also led to Jim's newfound Muppet career to grow, as he was starting to get contacted to create advertisements with his unique and wacky approach for Wilkins Coffee, resulting in the widely popular set of commercials featuring the shockingly crazy antics of Wilkins and Wonkins. You know, people who don't drink Wilkins Coffee just blow up sometimes. Oh, that's a lot of... See what I mean? In fact, these guys became so popular that they even went on to appear in commercials for other products like Frank's Soda. Why were you speeding? I was going for a cold soda. Frank's? No, just any old kind. Next time I'll say Frank's. However, as great as all this sounds, there is still the catch that, despite all of their success, Jim and Jane were still university students, and the biggest struggle was working on Sam and Friends and making other appearances and their studies, often doing what they can to balance their schedules between work and school, or even sacrificing time in one so that they could focus more on the other. Even after they both graduated, they inevitably fell in love and got married, and once Jane started to have children, that was when the talks got serious to bring in other people to perform as the Muppets so that she can devote her life more as a mother. Their university buddy, Bob Payne, already had experience working on Sam and Friends, but then after they took a trip to the Puppets of America convention, they hired Jerry Jewell as their first employee to both perform and write, and met a hesitant 17-year-old named Frank Oz. He saw great potential in the boy, which is why Jim stayed in touch with him, hoping that after he's old enough, Frank could come and work for the Muppets. But then came the year 1961. Sam and Friends was still highly popular and even won an Emmy in 1958. However, Jim was ready to move on and because of working on Sam and Friends and the Wilkins commercials, along with visiting some puppet conventions over the years, he grew a strong passion for puppetry and wanted to experiment with new ways that he could play with the medium. And so, at the end of the year on December 15th, the team created the final episode called Last Show, which concluded in the way that Jim knew how to do best. Have the entire set get blown up. Over the six and a half years that the show was on the air, a big mystery that fans have wondered to this day is the total amount of episodes. You see, since this was still during televisions and Jim's beginnings, most of the episodes were live and neither Jim or the station recorded those episodes at the same time. It wouldn't be until later in the series that they've done so, but even if they got some recorded, there are still a good amount of them that ended up lost. As for those that are found, there are some episodes that can be found at the Paley Center for Media, and others have been uploaded on YouTube for the public to easily find, which either originally aired on WRC-TV, were from his previous shows like Afternoon, or were recreated by Jim and Jane. Ever since they made their debut, the legacy of Sam and Friends did end up getting overshadowed by Jim's later and more popular works. However, they are still a very significant moment in television and Jim's history as Henson's first steps into entertainment. And with that historical significance, on August 26, 2010, 10 of the Muppets from the series, including the original Kermit, were donated to the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. On its own, it was a very simple show. Just four minutes worth of a silly sketch, usually the Muppets lip-syncing, and a plug mostly for SK Meats. But they were essential to establish the foundation of Jim Henson's legacy and the beginning of the Muppets. And the joy that they were giving to the viewers of Washington, D.C. was only a taste of what Jim was going to give to the rest of the world. Sam may have stopped escaping to his friends decades ago, but Jim and many others have continued that habit for him. <laughs> Once they opened up their schedule after Sam and Friends, Jim and Kermit were busier than ever during the 1960s. 
Thanks to the great success of the Wilkins coffee ads, Hanson was called to produce even more commercials for numerous of brands in the same style as Wilkins, like Clausen's Bread, Wilson's Meats, La Choy, Fago, Frito-Lay, and many more. Some of them even have Kermit involved, although he did end up getting the Wonkins role. Help! Did you bring a loaf of Clausen's Bread? No! Why don't you drop down to the grocery store for some? At the same time, the Muppets also went on a little tour to appear in just about every late night talk show at the time to perform their famous sketches, including the Ed Sullivan show where he was first introduced as Jim... Newsom's Puppets? Eh, close enough. But while Kermit would take on these small commercial roles and participate in the unaired pilot Tales of the Tinker D, the first true Muppet celebrity was a dog that was originally built for the Purina Dog Chow commercials, but later got his fame as a sidekick in the Jimmy Dean show by the name of Rolf. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here as official spokesman for the dog world. And in the words of our president... Oh, wait, 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 wait. You president? Oh, yeah, we dogs have a government just like you do, you know. Oh, well, who's your president? Lassie, of course. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, the people that Henson met at the Puppets of America convention came in to start their collaboration with Jim. There were the two men he encountered through Krukla, Fran, and Ollie creator Burr Tilstrom, Agent Bertie Brillstein, and puppet builder Don Celine, to which the latter's first creation for Jim was Rolf. And later in 1963, as their business and their family were noticeably growing, the Hensons decided to move to New York City where they also met up with Frank Oz, who has officially decided to join the team. Throughout this entire growth, Jim was still able to have the creative freedom to experiment both with and without puppets, allowing him to create projects such as the Oscar-nominated timepiece and the 1969 TV special Hey Cinderella, which featured an updated Kermit. Instead of being the lizard-like creature from Sam and Friends, he was given a more recognizable identity with a pointed color and webbed feet, where he was then forever known as Kermit the Frog. I know I'm a frog, you don't have to keep reminding me. But during that time, John Stone, who worked with Jim on Cinderella, invited him to talk about an opportunity to create a new batch of colorful characters for a show made by the non-profit company, The Children's Television Workshop. He was hesitant at first, but he decided to try it out and get involved with what they later call Sesame Street. Set in the small inner city community of Sesame Street, the show combines live action, animated, and Muppet segments to educate children through sketches on a variety of lessons and basic skills, from cognitive goals like learning the alphabet and counting numbers, to effective goals like teaching tolerance, life and death, and what is happening in the world around them. The street all started in the mind of television producer Joan Gans Cooney, who noticed something that was prominently missing in the medium in relation to children. In the late 1960s, around 97% of American households had a TV set, and kids were obsessed with them. In fact, children between the ages of 3 and 5 spent half of their time awake just watching TV. Not to mention how they could also be very influenced by what they watch. Studies have shown that if what they see on screen is entertaining enough, kids will retain what they have watched and adjust their view of the world around them based on that. That was what made Cooney believe that if television can have that kind of power, then it should be used to teach kids valuable lessons and basic educational skills instead of, you know, learning the lyrics of a beer commercial jingle. You say you care enough to only want the king of beer. But most importantly, Joan wanted to use television to help children who are less fortunate. During that time, there was a clear problematic gap in the educational system between social classes, where the disadvantaged, like those that live in inner cities, and especially children of color like black kids, end up getting further behind in their education than those who are more fortunate. And so, one night in her New York City apartment, she held a dinner party where the guests included her boss from the WDN-TV station, Louis Friedman, and experimental psychologist Lloyd Morissette, 
and they all discuss about their issues with the educational gap and the effects of television and decided to collaborate on a brand new show that could be the solution to their problems. Cooney's first step was to research how they could be capable of pulling off this plan by conducting a study called The Potential Uses of Television in Preschool Education which helped shape their mission to create an educational program that is not only easily accessible to everyone, but to also help lower class children to get more ahead at school and have their opportunity to learn be expanded more than just being minimal at best. And through that research in 1968, Cooney received a million dollars from the Carnegie Corporation, which Morissette was the vice president, in order to form her new company called the Children's Television Workshop, along with her team getting an additional $8 million worth of grants from the federal government, the Ford Foundation, and the Corporation of Public Broadcasting to fund the show. Now that the team got the money, it was time to find the crew that would bring the series to life. Some of the notable people Clooney brought in include Samuel Gibbon and John Stone, whom the three previously worked together on another children's program, Captain Kangaroo. Also, there was Harvard University professor Gerald S. Lesser, who created and headed the National Board of Advisors for the show that was in charge of what the kids would learn when watching. But then there was one more person they needed to grab the children's attention. Someone with the television experience that could easily create something that was unique and quickly memorable, and Stone knew the perfect guy for the job. As I've said before, Stone previously worked with Jim Henson on the TV special Hey Cinderella, and asked Jim to come to a seminar regarding this brand new show for children. When Cooney first met Jim at the meeting, he was just in the back and a bit reserved to himself while barely spoken a word. However, when the team discovered what he was capable of, that's when they knew that Henson was a great fit for their show. At first, Jim was a little uncertain to join, since he wanted to avoid the stereotype of having puppets be exclusively kids' entertainment and have the Muppets make people view puppetry as an art form that can be enjoyed by kids and adults. However, the series' mission was something that Jim highly admired and made it too irresistible to say no, so he agreed to have the Muppets come on board. He also asked for a deal that he would retain the rights to any Muppets that he would create for the show and agreed to a 50-50 split of the profits made on the character merchandising between him and the children's television workshop. And with everything in place, there was just one more important component to have before they can officially say that they have a show. A title. During a good amount of development, they were temporarily calling it the Preschool Educational Television Show, and the team got incredibly worried that the series didn't have a real title. It took them a while to figure it out, but they finally settled on the one that they, well, hated the least as documented in the pitch reel that was a parody of that moment starring Rolf and Kermit. What, what was that? Sesame Street. You know, like open sesame? It kind of gives the idea of a street where neat stuff happens. Kermit, why you're a genius. Mwah. Yuck. Sesame Street, I love it. The kids will love it. I can see it. Up there in lights, the children's television workshop presents Sesame Street. And once they know what to call it, that was when they hired songwriters Joe Raposo and Jeff Moss to create an upbeat theme song to set the tone of the fun times that audiences would get themselves into. They were also in charge of writing the musical numbers during the show, which to this day, theirs are still the most memorable and most popular songs of the program, including Sing, I Love Trash, Rubber Ducky, and their most acclaimed song, Being Green. It's not that easy being green Having to spend each day the color of the leaves But this experiment was not complete yet. Even with all the materials in place, they still needed to see if their mission can actually work on children. After producing five test episodes and presenting them to some audiences, they find that the results were great. Sometimes. They found that the show was able to retain children's attention throughout the entire hour of each episode, 
However, while the Muppet segments were a surefire hit, the live-action segments with the people on the street, which the location of Sesame Street was inspired by a United Coalition commercial that was filmed in Harlem, made the kids lose interest in what they were watching. So, considering that those scenes were essential to the show, they couldn't just get rid of them entirely. That's why the team decided to reshoot the segments so that they could add some new Muppets living with the live actors, played by a new puppeteer that joined Jim's crew, Carol Spinney. These include Oscar the Grouch, the pessimistic trash dweller who loves being negative and had orange fur in the first season, but then had it switched to green in the second, and Big Bird, who originally had a more goofy-like personality with a tiny head and acting all clumsy and dumb in the first episodes, but Spinney then recommended to change his personality to act more like an 8-foot-tall child, where he resides with Bob, Buddy, Jim, Gordon, Mr. Hooper, and Susan. <laughs> oh, my oh, come on. She's eight feet tall. No, she's not. Oh. She's only four oh. feet tall. I'm holding her up, Big Bird. Hey, what's all that cheering on your radio there? Well, that's for the President of the United States. He just made an important speech. He did? Uh huh. The President of the United States? Yeah. Boy, yeah. that's a pretty important person, isn't it? Some of the other Muppets that were a part of the show's beginnings include Cookie Monster, a monster with an insatiable appetite for cookies that originated in an unaired commercial and a few comedy sketches with sharp teeth, Ernie and Bert, two roommates that were the first Muppets to solidify Jim Henson and Frank Oz as both friends and a comedy duo, Grover, a hyperactive and optimistic monster who is often clumsy, Guy Smiley, a highly energetic game show host, and of course, Kermit the Frog, who either interacted with the other Muppets or go around as a reporter for Sesame Street News Flash. Hi, oh, th this is Kermit the Frog of Sesame Street News, and I'm speaking to you today from the children's zoo where people come to see and pet the friendly animals. During the start of the show, Kermit was getting some criticism where he was starting to be viewed as too commercial. He was taken out during the second season, but then came back for the third and so forth. Although his appearances did get reduced and was considered more as a guest star when he did appear. There was also another Muppet that premiered at the time named Roosevelt Franklin, a black Muppet created by Matt Robinson, who also played Gordon in the street segments. However, due to the criticism of the way that he is portrayed as a black character, Roosevelt was inevitably cut out of the show a few years later and prompted Robinson to quit, resulting in his role as Gordon to be played by Hal Miller and then Roscoe Orman. On November 10, 1969, after years of research and development, Sesame Street aired its first episode on PBS, and the work paid off very well. While it was only able to reach two-thirds of the whole country, it was watched in 1.9 million households by over 7 million children, and the people who did watch it, especially the kids, absolutely love it, already calling it one of the best TV shows that set a new standard for children's programming. It even started off getting three Emmys, a Peabody Award, and a Prix Jeunesse. However, it did not start off perfect. While the show tried to have some diverse representation in the street segments, it did receive criticism for it being rather lacking in terms of Hispanics and women. Later on, the show addressed these issues by adding in more human characters like Luis, Buffy, Maria, Linda, David, and Olivia. At the same time, by its first 10 seasons, more Muppets were introduced to the cast, including Harry Monster, Mr. Snuffleupagus, Count Von Count, Barkley, Telly Monster, and Elmo, as well as new puppeteers joining the crew, such as their first gay puppeteer, Richard Hunt, and the first female puppeteer working for the Muppets, Fran Brill. By the end of the 1970s, their core mission was growing more and more into a reality, as 9 out of 10 inner city children were watching Sesame Street, and around 9 million American children were watching it on a daily basis. And once the FCC allowed commercials to air during children's shows in 1984, Sesame Street was able to thrive on its merchandising by earning $42 million just on that by 1987. Around that decade, 
the show started to step up their game in terms of what to educate children. Not only talking about subjects that was considered taboo for television, such as breastfeeding, but also events that reflect on what happened to the live actors, like Maria giving childbirth when actress Sonia Manzato was pregnant, and death when Will Lee, the man who played Mr. Hooper, passed away. Big Bird, uh, don't you remember we told you? Uh, Mr. Hooper died. He he's dead. But I don't like it. It makes me sad. We all feel sad, Big Bird. He's never coming back? Never? No. You know, I'm gonna miss you, Mr. Looper. That's Hooper, Big Bird. <laughs> Hooper. <laughs> When the 1990s rolled along, it was a new era for Sesame Street, as they've lost many of their key players, including Joe Raposo in 1989, Jim a year later, Richard Hunt, producer David Connell, John Stone, and Jeff Moss. But they did also gain new girl Muppets that became prominent members of the cast, such as Zoe and Rosita, and even built a new set that expanded the street by the show's 25th anniversary. In the 2000s, the new millennium started with a new name for the company making the series, since there's nothing they can create that could ever top this, going from the Children's Television Workshop to Sesame Workshop, and the subjects that Sesame Street could talk about grew wider and more impactful as they began talking about real-world events that were happening in a way that children could understand including the 9-11 attacks, natural disasters, and the AIDS epidemic in South Africa, where for the latter, they created the first HIV-positive Muppet called Kami. And along with her, even more Muppets were added to the street gang, such as Murray Monster, Abby Kadabi, and Julia, the first autistic Muppet. Regardless if the series is meant to teach children their ABCs, the fact that this is a show that is still running for over 50 years means that it is impossible for it to have that status without getting into some controversy, especially when it came to angering right-wing personalities. When the show premiered, Mississippi voted to not air Sesame Street in the state due to how it featured a diverse cast and how everyone is treated equally. But after being publicly called out by the New York Times, they changed their minds three weeks later. Also, in the mid-2000s, there was a sudden uproar over the possible idea that Bert and Ernie could be gay. However, Sesame Workshop did step in to deny any of these allegations and shut down any idea if there are any gay Muppets in the show, a decision that they later regretted. And I think by saying that, it almost sounded like it would be something wrong with it if they were gay. Mm -hmm. If you relate to these characters as gay, that's fine. That's what makes Sesame so special. If you relate to them as not, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But that denial, if you will, I think was a mistake. There was also another one years later that they for sure did not regret during the COVID pandemic where after vaccines were confirmed to be safe for children ages 5 and up, Sesame Street went on a campaign to promote vaccination for kids, which of course upset politicians like Ted Cruz and caused them to attack characters like Big Bird on social media. But not all controversies relate to triggering the conservatives. In 2015, Sesame Workshop made a deal with HBO to first air the newer episodes on their channel and then appear on PBS and on the web nine months later. A move that has often been criticized for breaking the show's original mission of being available to children amongst the lower class by having its main platform be only available to the more privileged. There is no denying that Sesame Street became one of the most important shows on television, and has since went on to become the biggest puppet franchise in the world, where as of 2022, the show earned more awards than any other children's program in history, including a grand total of 220 Emmys, three Peabody Awards, a Hollywood Walk of Fame for Big Bird, 11 Grammys, a Foreign Language Advocacy Award, a Common Ground Award, and an American Ingenuity Award. They also spun off two theatrically released movies with 1985's Follow That Bird and 1999's Elmo and Grouchland, 
35 TV specials, 180 albums, two theme parks called Sesame Place in Philadelphia and San Diego, and not to mention all the books like the monster at the end of this book, the rides outside of Sesame Place, the video games, and the list goes on. Not to mention the numerous of spin-offs all around the world with several countries having their own version of Sesame Street and some characters having their own show like the Not Too Late Show with Elmo, The Furchester Hotel, Abby's Amazing Adventures, Cookie Monster's Foodie Truck, Mecha Builders, and many more. Nowadays, almost everyone on this earth had a moment in their childhood where they grew up watching Sesame Street periodically. No matter where they live, what color is their skin, or no matter what kind of person they are. This alone cannot do justice to highlight the cultural impact that the show has made, and the importance it has to the history of television, where it established a new standard for children's media and helped fill that hole that the medium needed to make use of the viewer's time so that they can learn. Not just their ABCs and 123s, but also understand the world around them in order to become more kind, empathetic, and selfless. Everyone says that they want to make the world a better place, but Sesame Street is the closest to actually doing that with their colorful characters all living in that one unforgettable block. It's no wonder why everyone is asking how to get to Sesame Street. But going back to Jim, while well, he was very pleased of how successful the show became and how it made the Muppets like Kermit a household name, he was also a bit disappointed of how this was holding him back from his goal of having puppetry, especially his Muppets, be viewed as a form of art that can be enjoyed by both kids and adults. While he admired what Cooney and her team at the Children's Television Workshop tried to accomplish, Jim had a different goal in mind. One that would make the Muppets be viewed not just as educators for children, but also as entertainers. And if Jim and Kermit wanted to make that happen, they would have to put on a show. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this part and can't wait for the next, then make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out. Now that we've taken a look at the most famous show that featured Kermit, We'll be going into the Muppets' next big adventure on the most famous show that starred Kermit. There's a lot more Muppet history coming, and I'm just getting started. So, until next time, see you later, dudes! I've seen enough, let's leave. <laughs>